Thursday, March 7th, 2024. My name is Carol Weinshell. I'm the Vice President of Program and Membership at Congregation Road of Sholem. And we are continuing in our series of American cinema with Rabbi Eisenberg and Paul and Marsha Friend. The beauty of Zoom is Rabbi Eisenberg is at home sitting in his study and Paul and Marsha are in New Jersey, I believe, sitting in their study. What, what a wonderful thing we can do here together and be able to have a program such as this. I'm going to ask you that if you have a question to please raise your hand. I want anybody who has a question to have the opportunity, but I'd like to make sure that everybody has the opportunity and not just one person asks the questions. So without further ado, tonight, just to give you the recap, the first session was um, Jews Behind the Scenes of American Cinema. Mm -hmm. Tonight is Jews on the Screen in America Cinema. So again, what I say to you is I suspect we're going to learn a lot, we're going to laugh a lot, and we'll share a lot. It's great to have all of you here, and I'm going to ask Rabbi Eisenberg to take it away. Thanks, Carol. Um, just to begin, and I'm going to turn it over to Paul in a minute to tell an interesting story that we didn't get to tell last time. But my first show and tell is this, which some of you have seen. And one of the uh, Jews behind cinema, in this case, world cinema, really, but was Al Brodax. Yep. The animator. Yeah. Al Brodax was the producer and animator of Yellow Submarine by the Beatles. Jewish. Okay, anyway. Um, I'd like to I'd like to open with uh, first welcoming everybody and turning it over now. You know, before I turn it over to my uh, friend Paul Paul Friend, um, I I just want to say that the world, as we all know, is <clears throat> in such turmoil, and there's so much darkness around that it can be so unrelenting that at times. You just need to release, let go, have a little fun, talk about things like our topic tonight that are interesting and fun and a diversion. Um, and it may not have the weight and importance of the things you might see in the news or read in, in the uh, you know media, but um, if we are not, if we don't let ourselves um, have these diversions, you, you can just go crazy and it's not healthy. So in that light, in that spirit, um, I'm now going to turn it over to Paul. Thank you. So I'm here with my wife, Marsha, and our uh, Chihuahua, Trixie. <laughs> You can see peeking out. She's asleep. Of the sling, <laughs> but she's asleep. The it, it's funny, Rabbi. You you showed the album The Yellow Submarine, and I remember seeing that movie when it came out in 1969 at the what was then the Community Theater in downtown Fairfield. I know. I think it's been bought by Sacred Heart University. I don't know if they've renamed it, but it, it brought back memories of uh, uh, that and. Uh, you know, one other funny story about that is that the Beatles thought it was going to be a disaster and wanted nothing to do with it until they saw uh, a draft of the movie. And they were so excited about it that they filmed a little scene that's included at the end of the movie. So uh, they were, boy, were they wrong. They thought it was going to be schlocky. They thought it was going to be like the Beatles animated cartoon that was on between 65 and 67. Mm -hmm. uh, quite a different experience. So I, I recommend the movie. Uh, and uh, as George says in the movie, it's all in the mind, you know. So I thought I would start with a funny story that is, has nothing to do with Jews in cinema, but it kind of demonstrates that I'm not really the movie fan, but I have learned a lot from the professor. I don't mean Trixie, but Marsha <laughs> sitting next to me. 
um, Marsha had asked me if I had ever seen Gone with the Wind, and I said no. And her one word response was, when I said I hadn't seen Gone with oh, the Wind, you said, really? What he always hears from me, real? So she sat me down, choice of words delivered there, to watch Gone with the Wind. And, and the movie starts. Um, you know, I think it even started with the, yeah. the orchestral thing. Yeah. And I immediately blurt out, that's the theme to the million dollar movie. Which, Marcia, which I'm not from the New York yeah, area, so Marsha <laughs> didn't know. And I but I think probably all of you know that that was the million dollar movie broadcast mm -hmm. on channel nine, W O R, I think it was four thirty in the afternoon at, you know, after kids got home from school. Mm -hmm. it, but it was interesting that having not seen Gone with the Wind, I had no idea that that was the, that tune was the main theme to the movie and that- the To a billion, billion dollar, dollar movie. Yeah, to a, <laughs> yes, to a, a million dollar movie. So I just wanted to share that with you. It's kind of a, a funny true life story. Rob, I don't know if you have a similar tale or if you have a, you know, to that one. I do, I, well, not not really, but I have just a quick an uh, anecdote about the community theater, which oh, was <clears throat> um, many of us who grew up in the Fairfield Bridgeport area remember the community theater right off the post road in yeah. downtown Fairfield. And one of my early experiences with community theater was seeing a movie there in the summer of 1964. Also, that was produced by a Jewish person named Walter Shenson. <laughs> and was directed by a Jewish person named Richard Lester uh, called A Hard Day's Night. Um, but I, I have to tell you, this is truly a case where I can tell you, I saw the movie, but I did not hear a word. And I still have a vivid memory of being a 11-year-old um, kid going to that theater, sitting there, and listening to screaming for an hour and a half, yelling, screaming, little girls, young girls and teenagers. And I'm sitting there saying, "I, what am I doing here? I don't know anything that's going on in this movie. All I, all I am doing is seeing images on the screen. <laughs> well, Rabbi, I'll, I'll top that before moving on. I was 18 months old in the summer of 1964. My mother brought me and my grandmother to see A Hard Day's Night. It was the first movie I ever saw. And my mom to this day tells me, she was very proud of me, that she said, you, Paul, didn't scream. <laughs> oh. Everyone else might have, but she, because she was afraid I was going to you know, get yell because I'd be 18 months old. But she said she was astonished that I focused on the movie and she said did not make a sound. No, other than what you might have done in your diaper. But anyways, let's That's go. Back. Be, Rabbi, before, before we go any yes. further, because yeah. I have to know everything, as you know. Okay. Uh, Anita Andre, welcome. But I would like to know who you are because I don't know you. Anita, will you unmute and tell us who you are? Do you know Paul and Marsha? Are they Paul and Marsha? Are they friend, friends of yours? Okay. Okay. Ruth and Jules. Those are those mine. Are, okay. And Carla. Ours. Anita, okay. I'm sorry I don't have a mic. This is, but I can't read the rest of it. This is oh, Glenn. Hi, Glenn. Okay. That's Glenn Germain. Okay. So, Anita, cool. are you going to tell us who you are? Glenn. Anita is Glenn. It is Glenn Germain. Okay. Anita is his wife. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, I, I am very, very tuned in to security. knowing Carol's who is about on security. Zoom. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Well, now well, it's back to you. Paul and Marsha, take it away again. You know, originally um, we thought, or I thought, you know, I had an idea, like, you know, pick a major Jewish actor or actress of the last 100 years. You realize we're almost at the 100th anniversary of the Academy Awards. And, but Marcia came up with a better idea. Rather than talk about 
you know, Jewish actors and actresses on film to talk more about, I'm going to use the word, she may disagree, Jewish themes on film. Uh, Marsha made the point that that's probably more interesting than saying, you know, in 1920, X was big, followed by Y is big. Um, and let's see, the... Um, Carla may have to leave, but that, uh, sorry about that, Carla. She's having okay. speaker problems. Anyway, I assume everyone else can hear us. So instead of going through a list of you know, the biggest star in, in, 19, in 1950 was so-and-so, we want to talk more about themes, uh, literally expressions of Jews and, and more, you know, more importantly, Judaism and Jewish culture on film, on screen over the past 90, 100 years of film and Marsha, I'm, I'm hearing your prompt yeah. comment. Yeah. <laughs> so I, we already talked last time a little bit about movies, you know, that kind of featured Jewish themes. Um, we talked about to be or not to be Casablanca that didn't mention Jews, other things that didn't mention Jews. And Emil basically, Zola, right. Yeah. Emil Zola. Basically, um, you know, as I was like looking over films with Jewish themes from the early, you know, pre 1950 or so, um, there are not really all that many Jewish themed movies. There are a few, um, but it generally being Jewish as a character or as a subject of a movie wasn't that um, common and wasn't really that known, I think, to most people. Sorry. And and I was looking at like where it started to change. And I think it started to change in the 60s and then much more into the 70s. I think one of the reasons may have been, and I have no backup except that like a, a observing how film progressed, is that I think the we were talking about the Jewish studio heads last time, and the Jewish studio heads very much wanted to assimilate. Yes. They wanted to be, you know, part of the WASP, part of the the American experience whatever and not necessarily be associated with jews and that's one of the reasons that you know as hitler was taking over they were still you know making concessions to release their films in germany and you know not Big not time. trying to put jewish things out there yeah and the actors of that time also if you were a jewish actor you changed your name you you, you were not bernard schwartz you were tony curtis you know, it, it just, you couldn't, none of the actors, you know, Edward G. Robinson, I, I actually don't remember what his real name is, but it's not Robinson. Um, you know, it, it wasn't done. And then I'm thinking, well, who were the Jewish actors who, who actually came out, came out as being Jewish? And like Dustin Hoffman. And he was really, I think, the first principally Jewish actor and I was reading um, a lot of stuff about The Graduate, and it was written and directed, written by Buck Henry, who was Jewish, directed by Mike Nichols, who was Jewish, based on a novel by Not a Jew, um, and, it, and it is about a WASP experience specifically. Yes. yes but Mike right. Nichols, in later interviews, said inadvertently, he, he realized that he was making the main character of Benjamin Jewish. And that was why Dustin Hoffman was perfect for the role. And, you know, the alienation from the WASP society, he felt that, that that was one of the reasons. And a lot of his his mannerisms and a lot of uh, the things around him were really more inspired by Jewishness than what came out of the book. And when, Joss, when Dustin Hoffman came on, he became a nerdy sex symbol. I mean, you, you, he wasn't Kirk Douglas. Yeah, he he was okay, he was great. he was your New York Jew, and his look and his mannerisms started to get more common in Jewish romantic leads as you go through the sixties and seventies. You have Richard Dreyfus and um, Richard Benjamin, and I meant to make up a list of these, but I was I talked about them at length with Paul. Now I can't think of who they are. It's okay, but, but we, um, we know but who you're Streisand. Well, I'll get into the women separately. Yeah, that's a... I'll get into the women is a whole separate thing. But Jewish leading men, Woody Allen also, because, I mean, he, he went in as comedic romantic lead, basically. Yeah. But the, these Jewish men who identify, who were identifiably Jewish, that you looked at them, most of their characters were Jewish, they became sex symbols. And you don't have that from earlier 
the earlier half of the 20th century. It really came, and my theory, going back to the studio heads, is the 60s is when the studio system broke down. It's when the rating system broke down. It's when the re, um, release of movies uh, started going more independent or not necessarily being made through the studio. Um, the whole, you know, the 60s, everything started uh, going against the production code and they started bringing in a lot of stuff that couldn't be shown in movies before then. And then in like 67 or 68 is when the MPAA and all the movie ratings came along because nothing was rated before that. It all had to be acceptable to a G audience. And now, you know, as, as Hollywood evolved in the 60s and moved away from the studios, the types of actors evolved, the types of stories evolved. Mm -hmm. And I think the Jewish archetype stereotype, some of it's stereotype, but it's more like the I identifying things, the big nose, the, you know, the, the New York accent. A lot of people think of the stereotype Jew is going to be the New York accent. And I go back to Groucho Marx on that. And as Paul says, Bugs Bunny on that. Um, <laughs> and you get that kind of, the stereotype of when you see that kind of character, you kind of assume they're Jewish. And up until the seventies, no one actually really said they were Jewish. They, they just, you know, it was a stereotype, but then in the seventies, it became more explored and, you know, the, like Woody Allen's comedies and um, the, the, I'm losing it here. Um, and the other films that were coming out that kind of dealt more with, Jewish people in various roles and romantic and Rabbi mentioned the Jewish leading ladies and I don't think it worked out as well for them aside from Barbara Streisand I don't think there's any other Jewish actresses maybe Lainey Kazan but she's not that big of a name who really were Jewish on screen most Jewish actresses to this day Natalie Portman Mila Kunis. Yeah. Um, yeah. The with, gee, yeah, I didn't know she was Jewish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they Group. are. They don't have the same identifiable traits that the Jewish male actors do. Yeah, Woody Allen had Louise Lasser, as you know. Yeah. For was, a while. Yeah. Mary Hartman. Yeah. 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 Was, it was who, enough to take the money yeah. on and. Yeah. But there weren't many, you're right. There weren't yeah, many. Yeah, Barbara and, Streisand is the only one who actually like embraced that New York. And, and I mean, not all Jews are from New York, but like I said, that in people's mind, if you said, think of a Jewish character in a movie, most of them are going to come up with a Brooklyn Jew. Yeah, and right. male. Most likely um, male. And you know, Marshall, I think this is maybe an interesting and worthwhile digression. Uh, we talked about last time Jews behind the scenes, Jews uh, controlling the or starting the major movie studios and even uh, most of the minor ones. But Marsha, you said something interesting. Um, so the studio system, you know, owned by Jews, factually speaking, uh, was existed for a long time. Uh, can you point to a movie or an incident that would you would characterize as maybe the end of the studio system and the beginning of, uh, let's say, the more my, explosive cinema of the 1960s? Yeah, my, my thing that I point to as the end of the studio system is the movie Anatomy of a Murder. Nothing to do with Jews, though. Do you remember the year-ish? I want to say yeah, 50, 58, 59 okay. in, that, in that area. Let's plug it. Um, 59. Anatomy of a Murder. Go yeah, on. because it was the first movie that i am aware of that was released by a very big name director Otto preminger no. with very with very big uh, actually he might have been i'll look that up <laughs> okay oh, and, he, and he was jewish too by the way yeah, yeah. Okay, that's what paul just said I'm like, Again. Yeah, he might have been. um and jimmy stewart i it was it was a big picture and it the um the production code refused to pass it because of the subject matter and um, a lot of the words in it. And not that they were horrible words, but they were words like rape and panties. And, and there was a married woman having an affair. And there was, right. you know, it was just, it was a subject matter that was not portrayed in movies at the time. And Otto Preminger said, screw it, I'm releasing it anyway. And Columbia Pictures released it. Um, and I think that was where the production code started falling apart Crumbling. 
and they started you know people started making violent movies and sexual movies and and putting in more dirty words you know they didn't get as dirty until that dirty until much later um even 10 years you know 10 years and things started falling apart through the 60s and i think as that was falling apart i think the studio system was falling apart because you got a lot more independent people coming in so that's kind of where i start with the modern what what is broken down into modern cinema and going from everything was g-rated um Clean, cut, cut cut right after the closed mouth kiss of no more than four seconds uh yeah kind of thing it's to like a train yeah yeah there's a train through a tunnel that's all you see uh to you know what what became okay we have to classify whether the movies are for children or for teenagers or adults or whatever so and i think that with that and with the ability to do more expressive things in movies i think that's where the studio system started losing it because they didn't have that kind of control over i, I also want to add a trend i noticed i noticed a trend when you and I, again i know you want to focus on jewish themes uh but before i just want to also add when it comes to the Jews on screen, you know, as actors and actresses, I, I noticed a trend and I correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I think I'm right that in the, the, the Jewish actresses and actors in the thirties and forties and maybe fifties, like Kirk Douglas, like Tony Curtis, like okay. John Garfield, Wonderful. like Paulette Goddard, like Melvin Douglas, Edward G and others, most of not all of them were um, born of two Jewish parents, uh, many of whom were immigrants yeah. from Europe. Um, but as you got into the 60s, 70s and, and, and into the modern day. In the second generation then. Yeah. Many of the Jewish actors and actresses, again, following on your theme, Marsha, many of them, you, you, you wouldn't even know they're Jewish. Yeah. And 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 a lot of that is because of their names. Harrison Ford, Daniel Day Lewis, uh James Franco, Jay Gillenhall, just to name a few. Um uh when you learn that they're Jewish, Scarlett Johansson, you know, now Scarlett Johansson is more strongly identified as a Jew and more closely tied, you know, has more close ties with Israel and so on. But the others where most of them, like Joachim Phoenix and others, were many of them were uh, products of intermarriage, and many of them had Jewish mothers. Right. So, in other words, if you're going by, you know, what does the conservative and orthodox movement consider to be Jewish, according to halakha, our movement say that it's matrilineal, that it's born of a Jewish mother, or through conversion. So many of these actors and actresses do not identify strongly as Jewish. You know, they might kind of admit they're Jewish, but they don't wear it on their sleeves. Many of them were not even raised Jewish. Right. Were only Jewish because their mothers were born Jewish. And I think that this is a more modern trend over the last three or so decades uh um as opposed to people like Lauren Bacall and Kirk Douglas and others you know in the 40s and 50s well i would say that's a trend of society as well as the films is that there is a lot more intermingling and a lot less um you know standard jewish upbringing in general in society right <laughs> it's curious that the movie moguls, many of themselves who, who were intermarried, by the way, this is no diss on intermarriage. I'm not, I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying, OK, that many of the um, moguls were intermarried, but the Jewish actors they hired were, you know, some of them, many of them were intermarried, but many of them were products of two Jewish parents. Right. Oh, yeah. OK, back to you guys. Yeah. When, when um, Marsh and I were looking at this, you know, it. it... It is funny uh, if, if you look at the uh, you know a actresses and actors, how many of them, and I'm speaking broadly, are Jewish or at least have a Jewish connection. Maybe it's only from the dad's side. Like Paul Newman, who I don't think ever identified as Jewish, but his father was Jewish. Yeah. 
you know, you, you can you, you can draw connections all over the place. Uh, it, it's kind of funny. And another thing, Rabbi, you, you triggered a, me a memory. I may have mentioned this last week, but it's worth repeating um, that the movie Gentleman's Agreement 1947, which did win the Oscar, uh, I think for, for Best Picture of the Year, I think and we may have mentioned this story two weeks ago. Uh, I think it was a Daryl Zanuck yeah. movie. Daryl Zanuck, not Jewish, surprisingly, mm -hmm. but the story, which I believe is actually true or very close to true, is that the movie was inspired because Daryl Zanuck was denied entrance to a LA Los Angeles Country Club because the members thought he was Jewish. Well, you're a big man in cinema, in Hollywood, ergo. And the name is Jewish You must enough. be Jewish in Zanuck. It starts with a Z, ends with a K. Uh, and so I, you know, and I, I, I found that story, assuming that it's true or close to true, um, kind of amazing that it took that incident of being discriminated against uh, without even the gentleman being Jewish uh, to bring the story of anti-Semitism, which is what the movie is about, to the screen in 1947, when even after World War II, it's like like we said two weeks ago, weren't a lot of movies that were, oh, any movies, were very few that were overtly Jewish themed. But, you know, so again, uh, worth going back. So again, you know, on our journey talking about, you know, Jews on the screen, which we broaden out to the Jewish experience on the screen, um, we were thinking about the types of movies that feature Jewish themes, and we kind of broke it down. I think you could probably safely say that there's certain types. Uh, I don't want to say certain shticks, but there are, there are certain types of it uh, that Marsha and I were discussing. Um, and the first, for you know, for better or for worse, is, and I, I'm going to try to use this word broadly without a negative or nasty meaning, um, I would call, you know, stereotypical that's a, Jews. That's what I was using it as, yeah. Yeah, now, you know, yeah, stereotypical. It could be neurotic. It could be, oh, really frugal. It could also be yeah. academic achievement. So the stereotype, as I think of it, could go all over the way, maybe leaning negative, leaning positive, uh, trending neutral. Um, and I think that, you know, maybe a classic example, breaking out in the, mid 60s and after, after starting as a comedian, uh, would be Woody Allen. I know we already touched about that. Yeah. And I, by the way, I recognize that everyone- Yeah, and we're not all comfortable talking about it very now, but- I'm <laughs> very sensitive to that. But his early funny stuff was you yeah, know, funny. Yeah. <laughs> there, I think th there's a line from a, one of his movies, Stardust Memories, which I think was like eight, 1980, where a character, I think maybe an alien from outer space, says to the character of Woody Allen played by himself, oh, you're Woody Allen. We liked your movies, the earlier ones, the, the early funny, funny ones. ones. Yeah. So I think that's either the exact line or the close line. That that really was a little too on the nose. And again, that was like 1980, yeah. um, 1981. Um, you know, and I think that over time, there has been definitely over the last 40, 50 years, a movement we see away from one dimensional stereotypical roles, but you can definitely use, again, I know everyone has very mixed feelings about him, but if you were, you know, we people always talk, can you divorce the art from the artist? And if you could try to do that, you know, that would be a classic example of somebody making a career, if you will, of, you know, using Jewish stereotypes. And, a, and it, Marcus, it was a yeah. huge influence on comedians and movies to come i mean it, it it he broke ground for a lot of that type of comedy and that kind of um characters i mean he was taking advantage of the time i don't know if he could have been as successful without dustin hoffman and without other jews had been, who had been you know coming up as that the, as the nerdy romantic lead um so he kind of took advantage of that made it more comedic but yeah he yeah. That's he, right. He was the neuroses uh, example mostly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a, another person we might use as an example of the you know using stereotypical Jewish character, but leaning or shall I say trending positive would of course be Mel Brooks. Marshall, you agree with that? You know, um, he, I mean, his movies 
poke fun at, at Jews to some extent. I mean, other than uh, I mean, the producers <laughs> is uh, you know, it was his his uh, first 19, movie, 1968, just yeah. for, what 22 years after the end of World, of World War II. II. Yeah, I mean, that, that was a pretty bold thing, and I'm not sure anyone other than a Jew could have made that movie. Mm. Or at least had it had it well received. Um, and remember, a lot of the actors in Hogan's Heroes were Jewish. Yeah, including um, Werner Klemper. Yeah, that's all. That's yeah. So, um, yeah, Mel Brooks. Uh, and I was about to say something else. God, I hate one of those words. Um, <laughs> yeah, he uh, his comedy. I one of his movies, and I cannot actually hold what on. Are you I may have it mixed up. The Yiddish speaking Indians. The Yiddish speaking Blazing saddles. Blazing saddles. Yeah, thank you. The Yiddish speaking Indians and in Blazing Saddles. Oh, and speaking of that, I think there was also um, when Dustin Hoffman did Little Big Man, because there was always that thing about the you know Indians possibly being descended from the uh, tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was also part of Dustin Hoffman and Little Big Man. <laughs> Maybe. The boy being brought up by Indians. Ah, it, um, interesting there. Yeah, I don't know, but yeah, the the Yiddish speaking Indians and in Blazing Saddles was another nod to that. Um, oh yeah, yeah, was something that you know, and I guess you know the the juxtaposition of Indians and Yiddish, you know, hadn't been done before, and it was funny because it was just so ludicrous for, for those ridiculous. people who knew what they were speaking. Ah, good point. <laughs> Which would have been the Jewish people knowing what they were speaking, because I think a lot of non-Jews would just think it was a made-up language. Yeah. The, um, Marsh, can you think of like any other fa fam well, famous a actors or even actresses who would be a good evidence of the of, stereotype? Uh, Barbara Streisand, we already mentioned her. Right, and we're thinking about, you know, I when I, it's funny, I think about that, uh, I think about Funny Girl, which herself was Fanny, uh, the character of Fanny Bryce herself, a Jewish. Am yeah. I, am I, I'm right yeah. about that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. um, um, yeah, but I mean, but she also, as she went through, I mean, what's up, Doc? Um, although I don't actually think she says she's Jewish in that. You just kind of assume she is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's up, Doc? By the way, a great, uh, which I I loved when it came out in the movie theaters in 1973. Marcia didn't see it till a few months ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I think it contrasts her character, which you could say is Jewish, even though it's never mentioned at all, uh, versus the very uptight wasp of Ryan right, O'Neill. Ryan O'Neill, yeah. Uh, and and, and Madeline Kahn in that also as what I'll say, the other Jewish stereotype, if you've seen that movie, she's the uh, kind of like complaining Jewish mother type. <laughs> and even though, again, she's uh, extremely waspy in it, but I think uh, Madeline Kahn took... Uh, some of the Jewish stereotypes into her mm -hmm. acting as in co in comedy as well. Yeah. Did you see the message in the chat from um, Jules Mermelstein, Jean Wilder, Wilder and the first book? I, 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 I need to see that movie again. That has had with Harrison Ford. Oh yeah, Jean. Yes, Jean Wilder in general. I mean, that's starting with the producers. Um, and yeah, he continued blazing. No Sons. Frankenstein. Yeah, he continued again that kind of nerdy romantic lead in the of a Jewish stereotype. Yeah, he 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 was one he was fantastic. Yeah, and Frisco Kid had uh Harrison Ford in it also. Maybe I remember seeing it. Yeah. I was I was I was that before Star Wars or right after Star Wars? I don't remember. I think it may I think it might have been right. I think it might have been right after like 77, 78. Yeah, well, Star Wars 70, it was nineteen seventy seven. What were some of the other categories that you were getting to about? Oh, sure. Themes. Uh, you know, so again, we're talking about the Jewish experience as portrayed directly on film, on screen. Um, what else do we have? There are 79. movies that are seventy nine. So after yeah, Star Wars. After. I hate to, you know, I'll, I'll those people on, I'll call them Holocaust films, either directly about or influenced by the Holocaust, World War II, pre-World War II, leading up to post-World War II. As we mentioned last time, Casablanca, which is, Marsha, I know I always get the timing wrong. Um, 40, um, 44. 42. 42, right. so yeah. definitely in it. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm just looking at my list. I actually have it written down here. <laughs> to be or not to be. That's probably um, one. Marcia, you yeah. talked about Mr. S Mr. Skeffington. Mr. Skeffington. 1944, which... where one of the characters comes out of a concentration camp. Um, um, 
There's, right. Uh, Main, in fact, the title character. Am, am yeah, I right? so, yes, Mr. Skeffington. The title so. character. Uh, the Diary of Anne Frank, we mentioned that. Uh, and then, you know, you can leap across the decades to the more well-known modern film Schindler's List. Um, God, I forget when they came out. I know we saw it together. Uh, Probably like 90 to 94 in that area. I think there was a Steven Spielberg. Uh, that is one theme that continues to echo. I don't at, think at... we even mentioned Steven Spielberg last month when we were, last, last time when we were talking about Jewish directors. So, <laughs> Because it's endless. <laughs> yeah. Or, or Stanley Kubrick. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Which, uh, yeah. And by the way, one of my uh, favorite movie scenes of all time is, speaking of Mr. Kubrick, who was Jewish, is in the movie A Clockwork Orange, which Marcia doesn't like. And, no, I've never no. seen it. Well, will. <laughs> uh, there's a scene uh, in a record store where the main character, Alex, goes to a record store and picks up a copy of an album called 2001. It actually <laughs> was the soundtrack of 2001. He picks it up, looks at it, and puts it back. That's so, funny. Uh, I thought it was very funny, but nothing to do with Jews on film. Although you could talk a whole session on Stanley Kubrick. That's a whole. Uh, there's nothing really Jewish about his movies. I'm sure you can argue. Not you can all. try to extract something and come up with something, but I think you'd be hard pressed. Yeah, you know, yeah. except yeah. You know, with creativity, the alter experience. Yes. Um, what up? Next, we think you see the expressions of Jewish experience on in American cinema and probably other time other places too. Uh, we would call it family dramas and comedies, or you know, family. I think that probably the classic experience a movie that I would pick out would be Fiddler on the Roof, yeah. which Marcy the movie, I'm not going to talk about the, the stage presentation, and we, we've seen yeah, a number of stage yeah. versions of that. Um, I think Fiddler on the Roof, I didn't look it up sometime in the 1960s, but I, I 70s can't. So for the movie. What, oh, 70s? The movie was the 70s, yeah. Okay. I want to um, say, say 74. You know, you might say that's the ultimate in my estimation, I'd like to think everyone would agree, uh, Jewish family experience. Uh, there are other more modern versions 71. of that. 71? Okay, I think it was late 60s. Yeah. Okay. Crossing to Lancy uh, from the 19... With, with Amy Irving. 1990. And, um, and, um, Avalon, uh, Barry Levinson's movie about Jew a Jewish family. In... Actually, I was just thinking, although it's not... Uh, it it's not entirely my favorite year because I, I mentioned Lainey Kazan earlier and she's in that. Peter O'Toole. Right? Uh, Peter O'Toole. Uh, 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 I think he did. Yeah. I th okay. Was the um, but, um, oh God, the actor Mark. I can picture him so well and I cannot think of his name. Yeah, yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, the right. He's a writer and it's supposed to be a semi autobiographical movie. Um. And he takes Peter O'Toole, the Errol Flynn type guy, home to meet his mother <laughs> and family and the extended jewish family <laughs> so it's, it's it very is. funny <laughs> uh you know you know i i know i appreciate it when, when jules gave um you know comment can anyone else think about because you know the um films we're talking about right now family dramas or comedies can anyone come up with any other films that they would say could fall into the jewish family experience movie i see a hand raised the lees you have to unmute. You're mute, however, and and you're still muted. Or you can type into chat. You're muted. Uh, Jackie has her hand raised, too. Okay. Jackie, go ahead. This is not family themes, but you spoke about the Holocaust before. Go ahead. Go ahead. And then there was the movie Exodus. Right. And then, I don't know, was the wall of, I think the wall was made into a movie also. Besides the Anne Frank, and... I don't remember that. Yeah. Okay. The Wall. Uh, I assume you don't mean the Pink Floyd album. Um... No, no, it was a Holocaust book, I... and I thought I had read the book. I thought it was made into a movie, but I could be wrong. I but know. Exodus definitely was very popular. Yeah, and you, uh, and and that's you know I forgot. I forgot about Exodus, and that would be a big deal since that's about the formation of the state yeah. of Israel, uh, based on the Leon. I can never pronounce it correctly. Yours, yours. Yeah. Wow. I missed. I missed Exodus. Uh, I'm embarrassed to admit yeah. that. That's great, and that's why you know I encourage the participation 
of people because you know we can come up with stuff but we do want to have it uh, interactive but i think you yeah. also should mention roman polanski's another very controversial figure of course yeah, of course but his his supreme achievement uh the pianist with uh adrian brody which was one of the most powerful in my opinion uh, yeah, holocaust movies adrian brody won an oscar for that huh. Yeah. I think um, Leon Gould is unmuted now. Thank Leon, you. did you want to add something? Yes, there, there are. There's a, a major theme in American cinema, uh, which should not be overlooked. Right. And that is making it in America and the sacrifices which that entails, which could be quite severe. For example, in Body and Soul in 1947, John Garfield, he sold himself out to the mob in order to become a champion. And in uh, Duddy Kravitz with Richard Dreyfuss. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, which, which Richard Dreyfuss really hates, by the way. He, he Don't ask him about it. <laughs> you know, you actually, you just accurately predicted, I would say the next type of film uh, which we would call broadly the Jewish immigrant experience, coming to America, living in America, dealing with assimilation, cultural identity, the pursuing the American dream. And, you know, you could, um, you know, I, I always think of the comedy movie, An American Tale, with Fievel, uh, the mouse, also the name of my grandfather. Fievel Freund came to America in 1914 and became Philip Friend. Uh, I think Hester Street, not well known anymore, but uh, I think would count. Um, can anyone think of any other what I'll call Jewish American immigrant experience movies other than the ones that we just rattled off? Yeah, I just had one in my head, and I it and it's uh oh my god, the one by Paul Mazursky. Um, uh, and it, 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 it involved the Holocaust survivor. It, Marsha maybe could have, get a, look up Paul Mazursky's filmography, exactly. but there's the one that he did, and I'm, I'm blanking out on it. And another very obvious one is Goodbye Columbus. I mean, even though it wasn't direct immigrant experience, it was still, you know, second generation making it in America kind of thing. Right. So that would count, you know, if you want to yeah. continue the category broadly. Trying to find it. Okay. Um, well, I didn't. I got. I didn't get his full thing here. Uh, anyway, keep talking. Uh, I can <laughs> so do that. Okay. Um, another type of Jewish movie, as we continue to round the corner of the list. Uh, and the Amar should I discuss this movies that explore Jewish identity, grappling with faith. You know, I'll call it religious and cultural exploration. Um, you know, I kind of pulled Yentl out of a hat for that one. Um, but Marsha, you know, also reminded me of a movie that I think we did allude to last time. It came out in multiple versions. Would you say The Jazz Singer is also? Well, The Jazz Singer deals with um, the Jewish family and it deals with assimilation because that's what the main character is basically doing is, uh, you know, giving up the more traditional Jewish family to assimilate and be in show business. Mm. And uh, I think... Um... You all, I think you also said gentle, you might throw a gentleman's agreement into that category. Uh, I mean, well, that was like it's a simula thing, it's uh, a simulation, but it's not, it's a different, yeah, a different kind. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah I, I don't know if anyone can movie. think of other. I'll you know, I'll say religious and cultural exploration type movies because I I know there's been a, a number of them, but you know we could only because again we're trying to think about things that would, movies that would be fairly well known and still remembered. Uh, even after all this time. And so, Marsha, what are you looking at, Paul? Just don't look at what I'm looking at. Okay, I'm not going to look at what you're looking yeah. at. Um, you know, and uh, in fact, I'm going to, I'll throw this question out to Ruth and Jules. I thought of a category, but I have to admit, we couldn't come up to mind, so maybe Rabbi, Ruth and Jules, others could come up with this. Um, and I, I know it's, been made but couldn't think of it movies that, where you have jewish characters as political or social activists um what i'm saying is i believe there's been movies about that but i couldn't think of any 
Yeah, the one that just came out a few years ago uh, by Aaron Sorkin, uh, the trial of you know the uh, Chicago yeah. Seven. Yeah. Is there anyone? Wait, 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 wait. You mean, well, there was crosstalk, Rob. What was the movie you were thinking of? Um, the Chicago Seven. What was the name of the movie? Um, by Aaron Sorkin. The trial of the Chicago Seven. Yeah. We saw it on. Yeah, we saw it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we, we saw, saw it. it. In fact, I think Marsha yeah, said wait, that. I had mentioned it when we were talking about. Um, because I missed said Ab when he was talking about activists, and I said Abby Hoffman. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's one Mississippi burning, um, where I'm seeing Norma Ray also. Norma, right. Norma Ray is, yeah. uh, in fact, is that Richard Benjamin in that? Who plays the um, guy in that? That goes to make the union. Anyway. I don't remember. But, been... Yeah, I don't know, but but Norma, uh, sorry, sorry, Mississippi burning. You know, with two of the three who were murdered in that infamous story uh we're jewish yes you know civil rights activists that's another example yeah and um, um, yeah you know and i was thinking you know, you know instead of looking it up i thought i would throw out the question because i know i know it's been out there the um so what we've tried to do is you know and i i don't you know we weren't trying to artificially put stuff into categories but i think that we've kind of done a decent summary of the types of movies uh you know that have depicted the jewish experience now ruth and ruth actually jules just came up with an interesting one that's uh, a good one he said that, yeah that on the basis of sex the story of i think ruth bader ginsburg okay. yeah uh, there were both movies there was two movies rbg was a movie oh, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry yeah I yeah uh, yeah. uh, you mentioned the jazz singer, which we had mentioned previous, but I appreciate the con uh, you know, the contribution to that. We mentioned it first. You just didn't <laughs> say it. <laughs> Mazel tov. Thank you. We said it first. No. You... <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, you said it. <laughs> oh, Paul, we should also mention the movie. Was it called School Ties with um, uh, Brendan Fraser, uh, you know, on the subject of anti-Semitism? who experiences anti-Semitism at a boarding school, came out about 20 years ago or so, or more, 25. I think it was called School School Ties. Okay. Some of you may have seen it. We used to show it yes. at, huh. at youth group, you know, at, at USY or youth group kinds of activities. It was very widely shown in synagogues and JCCs around the country. Uh, Brendan Fraser did an excellent job in that movie, playing a young Jewish uh, student who is terribly persecuted on the basis of his Judaism. Yeah. So I just wanted to throw that movie in too. I appreciate that. Yep. Um, had it, you know, the, not a movie that was in my mind, but and I appreciate the contribution. Um, Basically, I think that, you know, you might say that we've gone to the end of our categorization of movies uh, portraying the Jewish experience. But we thought it'd be interesting to kind of put it into categories as opposed to this actor, that actress. Marsha, with respect to your notes, was there any concept that uh, no, we I, may not I, have addressed from what uh, you, in terms of the your uh, syllabus? I, my note, I think we covered everything I put down in my notes. Or maybe there's something we're missing that people yeah, think somebody else would add that they would come up with it. Maybe that you're thinking of and how it relates. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, does anybody have any category that we may have omitted? I was wondering about Jewish science fiction or Jewish horror movies, but I have to struggle with that no, one. Jewish horror movies, I mean, universal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> horror movies were, uh, were Carl Lindley. Yeah. I mean, the other thing, I mean, you could go into um, biopics of Jews. Right. So, yeah, there's lots of those out there you mean about well just jewish yeah biopics of jewish thing. people yeah yeah but we you know in, in trying to survey the world we were trying to map out the world if you will for you and again i think we've covered the uh metaphorical globe in terms of the jewish experience as portrayed in modern american cinema um you know uh there may be movies for example about uh israel in the middle east Talk about the the conflict, uh, but not, I don't. Not think... a huge amount in American cinema. Yeah, I think I, it's it's a subject. I can't that, think of any. Yeah, it's a subject that American cinema does not do a lot with. 
Right. And I'm, we're talking about American yeah. cinema, not about Israeli cinema or ma- movies that may have been made yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. We kind of noticed that that maybe might have been a theme, but we, without digging too hard, uh, we couldn't think of any or find any. I think your your knowledge is unbelievable. Between the two of you, you know so much and you just can share and pull out dates and times and places. Estimates. And and yeah. <laughs> how did so let me ask you a question. Yeah. How did how did this whole subject pique your interest? Where did that come from? Marsh, what started your love of movies? Oh, my my love you... of movies just in general. Honestly, I never really thought about Jews in cinema until the rabbi asked us about this. Um, what triggered your so love that was of like it. movies my love, per se? My love of movies was, I will say, peer pressure. Um, I went to NYU okay. and um, probably around November or December of my freshman year, um, my friends dragged me to a black and white movie that I really didn't want to go to. And it was called It's a Wonderful Life. And I kind of got hooked on it there. And because I was living in the village, um, you know, and at NYU, there was, you know, there were a lot of films around, a lot of film students. And there was a particular theater there um, that we actually uh, walked by recently when I, I was there with a friend called Theater 80. It was on uh, St. Mark's Place over by First Avenue. 80 St. Mark's? Yeah, Probably. 80 St. Mark's okay. Place. Yeah. Okay. Um, that uh, every day they showed two movies, two different movies and just in rotation. And they would give you a two-month schedule in advance. And they were they were themed. So I, rem- I still remember... The first ones that we saw were It's a Wonderful Life, which thank goodness that was the first one we saw because had it been the second one, which was called Christmas Holiday with Gene Kelly, which was a horrible movie. <laughs> I don't think I ever would have watched another black and white movie. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, it's just, I went there so often. Um, I, I still remember they used to do Hitchcock double features. Um, probably my favorite that I went to almost every month was All About Even Sunset Boulevard. It was like every month, a double feature. And I must have done that like 10 times. What about the Thalia? Um, the oh, Thalia is, up, is was uptown. Yeah, yeah. You, take a, you take a subway, you go uptown. So what? I, even when I lived in New York, I always hated the subway. So, and I lived on 8th Street. So going to St. Lot. Mark's Place was like three blocks away. Right. And plus there was 8th Street Playhouse at the time. There was yes. a quad. You didn't need um, to uh, that there, was, there was um, whatever the one was on 6th Avenue. Um, I actually just saw a photo of it recently. I can't remember what we were talking about. I said they used And to... Paul, how about you? Where did this start for you? <laughs> oh. I mean, listen, okay. I didn't see Sunset you Boulevard see or Gone All with About the Wind. Eve or Gone with the Wind <laughs> or God knows what else until I met Marsha. Because, yeah, I... you know, I was the music nerd. And listen, I, I loved Carol going to, you know, current movies at the county cinema, 99 cents, the community, the Beverly, the yeah. Mar- yeah. current movies. And I remember like one time my dad, wa- they were showing at the Merritt Theater, Captain's Courageous from the 1940s. Oh, and my dad really movie. wanted to take me to see it because it was a big deal uh, when he was 13. Spencer I remember Tracy, seeing it. Spencer Tracy, but Freddie Barth- Bartholomew. We didn't rehearse this. <laughs> Carol, he dragged me in to the see worst it. Portuguese accent. And yeah. I didn't want to see it. And I didn't like it because it was in black and black white. and white. But he loved it. It was like a one-off showing at the Merit. Yeah. I and, remember the Merit. That was my neighborhood. So we know. So again, I was a fan of what I'll call pop movies of the moment. You know, uh, so I saw Star Wars when it came out, et cetera, et cetera. Saw lots, consumed lots of movies from the mid 70s to, to the mid 90s. But going back to classic cinema, you know, I wasn't joking yeah, I, with the whole Gone with the Wind thing. So I yeah, blame it I, on. Yeah, I went through like sure. phases um, after I got, when, once I got a VCR, I had to get a second VCR because I was always renting movies and dubbing them so I could keep them. And I went through phases where like every single Barbara Stanwyck movie, every single Betty Davis movie, every single Alfred Hitchcock movie, every, and I would hunt down. There were, there were um, quite a few video stores in the village where you could get movies that were never released on video. <laughs> and I had quite a in, few of them. Yeah. Was that what it was called? It was on the second floor. 
Yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Daryl, with your permission, I want to mention a movie. I want to mention a movie that has not yet been mentioned. Please go ahead. Um, and you know, even though we've been, you know, this we've been keeping it light in many ways. Uh, so I apologize for making it a little bit more heavy and serious. But um, Paul and Marsha were challenging us to think about movies having to do with Middle East themes, Israel themes, and so on. And there's one movie that was not mentioned that I think should be, uh, which was controversial, and that was Munich by uh, Steven Spielberg, yeah. with a screenplay by Tony Kushner. Tony yeah. Kushner is quite well known as being pretty much anti-Zionist. Uh, it may, I may be oversimplifying it by calling him an anti-Zionist, but I will say that he's not the most pro-Israel um, playwright or screenwriter that there is. He's got very deep ambivalence about Israel. And again, I don't want to get controversial tonight necessarily about Israel, but that was a movie that um, addressed a very, very difficult subject. Mm -hmm. And uh, both Spielberg... Uh, and this was after Schindler's List. So with Schindler's List, Spielberg got all this, the cred he needed with the Jewish community that would probably last a lifetime. But then he made Munich and that kind of compromised his cred with, with, with certain segments of the Jewish community uh, who criticized him and Kushner for writing a movie that seemed... To, sh to present some kind of equivalence between the terror, the Palestinian murderers and terrorists in the 74, I think it was 74, 74, 72, 72 Olympics, thank you, and the Israeli um, operatives that came in to uh, exact uh, justice, I will say. I'm not even going to use revenge, but the movie essentially portrayed it as revenge perhaps more than justice. And for that, Spielberg got a lot of uh, crit criticism for. Mm -hmm. So. No, thank you. Um, Rabbi, I, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Paul and Marsha. Where did, where and how did you start with movies? Um, it's very easy for me to answer that uh, because Paul alluded to it at the very beginning. It was million dollar movie. Ah. WOR Channel 9, where the same movie was shown six days a week, or five days a week, rather, Monday through Friday, maybe once on the weekends, in the, in the afternoon after school, and then in the evening as well, twice a day. And um, I they, they would re re repeat the same movie every day for five or six days, five days anyways. And most of the movies that they presented Again, I grew up in the 50s and early 60s. Most of the movies that they presented were movies of the 30s and the and the 40s. Um, so the first time I saw King Kong was on Million Dollar Movie. I became a huge Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers fan because of because of seeing the gay divorcee on Million Dollar Movie. I became a big Henry Fonda fan by seeing the movie Slim on Million Dollar Movie. And also I have to note that Million Dollar Movie um, could not show long movies like Gone with, you know, um, Go with the Wind or you know movies like that because it was slotted into a two hour time mm. slot or so with commercials. And they also edited, they, I think Marsha, you can tell me if I'm wrong, I, 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 I didn't know to do a million dollar movie, but I, I, things were heavily edited to fit. Head, heavily edited, edited and cut and yeah. whatever. And but, especially on a uh, million dollar movie, they may have also been showing a lot of public domain movies and those things were edited like crazy. Yeah. You anything you wanted on those. But Carol, so, it yeah. didn't matter to me. Okay. I didn't know from editing. I was a kid. I saw these movies and I was enamored and I, I learned them by heart. Gunga Din was another one, you know, totally politically incorrect, whatever. Okay. Harry Grant is not, as an Indian. <laughs> but I, no, no, Sam Jaffe. He was the Indian, yeah. Did, did we say, did you say the Ten Commandments at all? 
you know, actually, we had forgotten we had we had talked. Paul and I were discussing this earlier this week about um, the biblical representation of Jews and Jewish stories, and I, I we were going to mention it, and I said in a way, like in terms of being, if you're presenting Jewish people to the public, I don't think like they're going to think, oh, the Ten Commandments or Samson and Delilah or those, because when you look at biblical Jewish, they were Jewish. Stories, yeah. Well, it's not they're not Jewish. It's also, it's almost like you're seeing um, like knights in the Middle Ages. It's like this almost phantom, mythological. it's like a fantasy myth mythological thing. Yeah. So it's I, not necessarily something that you relate to in your life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're looking at it like a co you know costume drama and um, that kind of thing. So the biblical movies, mm -hmm. when I thought about that, it's like, yeah, they, they show Jews, but it's not the same kind of connection to Judaism that we were talking about in a lot of our other right. movies. But what is interesting about the Ten Commandments, again, we could have a class, we could have a course just on biblical movies, okay? But the Ten Commandments, one of the things that's interesting is that um, it was the Cecil B. DeMille and the um, and the and the writers of that movie, the script writers, relied heavily on Midrash. Uh, and they um, they didn't you know, there were a lot of stories in there that were not from the Torah, but they picked they got them from Midrash and they had actually rabbinic consultants on that movie to help them come up with some of these stories that filled in the blanks, you know, about Charlton Heston and, you know, Moses growing up in the palace of Pharaoh and falling in love with um, Ann Baxter, you know, and. Did you ever see the silent version of it? The Cecil B. DeMille silent version. In the 1920s? Yeah. I never saw that. I haven't either. And I'm wondering how it compares because basically it's a remake. I mean, it's his own, it was his own film in the first place. And I've seen, you know, stills from it, but I actually have no idea how the plot relates to the 1920s version. I, I know. they both involved, I think they both involved a Nile river and they both involved plagues yeah. and a mountain and Sinai. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that kind of yeah, stuff. It was originally the Twenty <laughs> Commandments, but they edited. They it. cut it in half. Yeah, yeah. that was the yep. edit. That was the edited version of Million. Dollars. Oh, and Marsha and Paul, you should mention the history of the world part two on that on yes. that level. Yeah, which yeah, yeah well, we we've yeah, not seen that. Breaks. I remember I let two weeks ago I mentioned that the Ten Commandments. I think in the nineteen fifty five or so did like overtly mention Jews, which was interesting. I don't know if the, what they did in nineteen twenty five. Oh, Rabbi, speaking of edits, I. Something that is related to the million dollar movie, which you may have been a little too old for this, the 430 movie on Channel 7, uh, also heavily would edit movies because they had less than 90 minutes to show something between 430 and 6. And sometimes for big movies, like I think Ben Hur, oh, they would actually days, two or three days. They would show it over the course of like four or five days. Right. But they had Monster Week, just all Godzilla each day. Uh, that, that was another way for kids in the 60s and 70s to see old movies. So, Carol, I, great. I think we should see if people want to make comments or questions. Oh, History of the World Part 1. Yeah, I said Part 2. Part 2 is something they're supposed to be making. History of the Sorry. World Part 1, but that's where... Oh, was I? Oh, that's Mel, right. I did on Hulu. Yeah. yeah. Mel Brooks is playing Moses, and he's coming down with two, three tablets or something. Yeah. 15 commandments <laughs> and he drops one and he goes oi 10 commandments <laughs> anyway so does what? anybody else want to add something or about an experience you had a special experience um with a movie any of you um in quotes old bridge porters not old age just old We're offering Oscars to good questions. Yeah. I I will tell you that Judy, when Judy went to Brown, she had a friend named Joan. Joan grew up thinking that the word Machaya uh, meant air conditioning. Because one time Joan and her grandmother went to a movie theater uh, during a hot summer day you know where I'm going with this. And Joan's <laughs> grandmother says, walked into the theater where it was cool. And she says, oh, it's a machaya. Machaya <laughs> means like, machaya means like, it's a Yiddish word. It's based on Hebrew. 
I, somebody give me a good translation. It means mechai means great. A pleasure. A pleasure. A pleasure. Mechaya right. means the mechaya. great thing. The <laughs> great thing. Yeah. So, so but Joan thought Mechaya meant air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> Well, going to a movie was a very big thing for us. I I can't even remember the first time that I went. I mean, that just wasn't something we could really afford. Um, Carol, do we he, have like five minutes where maybe people could either unmute or put it yes, in the chat and tell us do. what was the first movie you saw do you, uh, in the movie theater on the screen? I don't remember. I remember the first play I ever saw, and that was My Fair Lady, and I was probably Lucky you. 11. Lucky you. And the first R-rated movie I saw was um, The Longest Yard, and I think Ruth and Jules took me to it. The what? <laughs> That's great. <great. laughs> And then the second R-rated movie I saw was Lenny, and that was a total mistake. But mom had dropped me off at the movie theater um, too early, so I snuck in and watched it. And that was, like, really a lot for a 14-year-old. Um <laughs> so can anybody, does anybody else want to share the first movie? Debbie? Sound of Music. Oh, my, my favorite. My grandmother. My grandmother took me. And it was, I, I don't remember how old I was, but. 10, what, 9, and it was like such a treat. And we got all dressed up to go to the and, movie. And Ruth and Jules put in How the West Was Won. That was true. Actually, I saw two in New York. Did you see it in the Cinerama? Yes. The, in so New York? Cinema. I was on TCM yeah. recently, and it is so weird when they show up. Because Cinerama, yeah. yeah. No, it was just the regular theater. The regular theater. Yeah, regular theater. Yeah. The yeah. first movie I saw was Bambi. I was maybe four years old. During those days, I know, during those days, Disney was re-releasing all these movies. So I saw Bambi when I was maybe four or five, and then I saw Snow White sometime later. But Bambi is traumatic. Yes. I mean, imagine a little kid seeing Bambi, you know, with mama being shot to death by a hunter. Yeah. But that was my first movie. And I remember just the being so enamored of the big screen. Anybody else remember their first movie, Jack? Jackie, yeah. This is not my first movie, but does anybody remember going to the movie theater for the 3D movies and you had to wear glasses yeah. to see it in 3D? They had special glasses that we had. You don't have to. Don't you have to do that? Don't have to do it. And didn't. They're, 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 although now they're like plastic and they're and you have to turn right. them. They, yeah. they were the cardboard ones. Uh, back in the day and didn't Daddy. they give dish and didn't they give dishes away on saturday or something oh i don't Maybe. know yeah Daddy, you i i got one uh okay old old yeller down downtown bridgeport you guys are seeing awful movies that, that was an awful movie yeah that was an awful movie and that then i had a friend, I had a friend when i was like 12 years old uh his father actually ran the projectors over at the Stratford Theater. And so we, once in a while, would get to see a free movie over there. Steve McQueen, Great Escape, uh, Hush Hush, Sweet Charlotte. That was another. You know. But uh, yeah, we got to, got to see a few movies over there for free. Ruth and Jules have their hands up. Yeah, I remember, I don't know if Marcy remembers this, Mom and dad loading us into the station wagon, parking backwards, and we all laid down in the back facing the movie theater. At, at the uh, movie screen. Uh, yeah, at the, at the drive in. At the drive in. <laughs> there were movies that we saw there that weren't Disney, because the only thing I can think of was Disney. It was like the county drive in or something. I remember they had a great playground. Yeah, Bridgeport had a drive in. We did over off Lindley Street, yeah. right? Candlelight. Yeah. Candlelight. Yeah, picks and candlelight. Yes. There you go. Yes. That yeah. was a big night to go. Big. Yeah. I saw Debbie. Exodus there. Can you believe it? Oh my. <laughs> Debbie, you had another one? I'm thinking that maybe I'm trying to remember. I think maybe the driving, maybe I saw um 
Mary Poppins. Those were like my two things I remember from childhood. But the other thing I remember is when I was 16 years old, for like a year running, the Merritt Theater in Bridgeport had only one movie, The Exorcist. Oh, no. well, that was back. You remember back in the day, especially in the mid 70s. Well, they... Now it is 19th week, you know, yeah. Jaws or, you know, the yeah, Godfather. So I remember watching Jaws. I mom was at Lomans and I absolutely hated Lomans. And I would stand outside and you could see the drive-in theater across the street. And I remember watching Jaws on the drive-in screen from standing in front of Lomans. Oh. <laughs> I didn't watch the Sheila. whole thing, but <laughs> Sheila, besides the dishes, do you remember anything else to share? No? Uh, okay. Carol, Debbie, the, 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 um, the Exorcist was directed by a Jew, William Friedkin. Friedkin, yeah. Yeah, we're everywhere. So many, oh. right. We're everywhere. We're all over the place. We're taking over the world. Erica? In our space. Okay. There. So my my uh, first movie that I remember seeing is uh, Love Italian Style. It's Gina Lola Brigida and Sophia Loren. I didn't see American movie till I came to this country. So love okay. American style or or marriage or, or divorce American style. I mean divorce Italian, Italian style, right? Divorce, but divorce I have or a marriage. Question. Uh, Walter Matthau, I like him as an actor. We, nobody mentioned him. Oh, right? you're right. Yes. And yeah. Neil, yeah. Neil Simon, Neil, I love Neil Simon. Good. Yeah, uh, I great. love the Cal California suite. Good name. Um, yeah, we didn't even talk about Neil Simon, guys. No. Yeah, yeah, for Jewish experience. Yeah. 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 You need another yeah. show. Yeah. <laughs> another um, program. <laughs> Erica, you you um, piqued a, a nerve for me now to take what you said to go to Nima. Because Nima, you did not grow up here. So did you have movies that you went to see like we're talking about? Uh, I'll talk about some experience we had. Uh, in the summer, we didn't have Amechaya. In other words, we didn't have air condition <laughs> in the late 1950s. Uh, so there, there was big screen, a uh, close screen on the, on the in the in the lawn area, and all the members of the kibbutz would sit there and watch the movie. And we, the children, would sneak in the back. And I remember there was a movie with Brigitte Bardot, and and, and they were kissing, and we were not allowed to see that. But uh, mm -hmm. it was, you know, we, it was cinema paradiso. That's how we, that was our life like. Uh, we were able to to watch. Um, Salah Shabbati, uh, I bet. Salah Shabbati. <laughs> Salah. Yeah, just, yeah, we saw some of the. Uh, I am Topol, yeah. <laughs> Foreign films. Foreign they, films. they were called Burekas movies because, you know, they were sort of about the Mizrahi uh, experience. Right. Yeah. yeah. One of the greatest people may have heard of is Salah Shabbati, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, with, we've... with uh, Chaim Topol before mm -hmm. he just became known as Topol and starred in Fiddler on the Roof. But in the 60s, he was one of the biggest film stars in Israel. Right. right. So this is right. now like Hanukkah around the world. Watch, watch now. Gracie, yeah. how about you? Uh -oh. and tell, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know if it was the first movie I ever saw, but I remember it vividly because in the Sudan, the movie theaters were open air. And so of course you didn't go until nighttime. And uh, we were watching um, Love in the Afternoon with Carrie Grant, uh, not Carrie Grant, Gary Cooper, Audrey Hepburn, Gary Maurice Hepburn. Chevalier. Oh. And all of a sudden the oh clouds God. just burst open and it started to pour and there were verandas like around the the edges and everybody made a mad dash nobody would leave the theater but we sat there under the verandas watching the movie until it cleared and we went back to our seats so that was one of my first experiences with the movies that's a great memory yes <laughs> so so we've been to israel we've been to the sudan we had erica who came from the Soviet Union and and didn't see movies growing up. Um, anybody else want to share? I mean, we didn't have television. In the 60s, we already had television and we watched lots of movies uh, from Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and foreign 
movies. Interesting. And there were Plus, some, as Marsha and Paul know, but especially Marsha, there were some really great movies coming out of those countries in the 60s, even though it was the Iron Curtain, some of the great directors of the time were front were working behind. I mean, that's that's where um, Roman Polanski started in Poland, and some of the Czech directors. And uh, Hungary, yeah, Hungary. And hun Hungarian Agnes uh, Varda, and um, right, and and really some great great filmmakers. You know, were working. You know. I can't think of this uh, the title of the film. It's a gift shop, and it's based like uh, in Hungary, a music. Yeah, shop. Um, yes. Um, oh, no. I love that movie. That's my favorite. Yeah, Corner or uh, Good Old Summertime, whichever one you wanted to pick. That's, and oh, the actor it's, it's, in it was um, actually Shop Around the Corner was supposed to take place in um, I thought Poland actually, but no. Wait, about uh, Erica, are you thinking of a four? Are you box? thinking? Are you thinking of a foreign movie or an American movie? It's American movie, but European actors. One yeah. of them. Right. Uh, Shop around the corner. It had um, Felix Bressert and um, uh, Cuddles, uh, uh, S.K. Sakal. And James Stewart. Jimmy Stewart. Right. One of them is Christmas in Connecticut, I think, the movie. <laughs> and he's the uh, chef, uh, yeah. the same actor in several movies. Yeah, I love him. Yeah, He's a very good actor. Connecticut is um, Barbara Stanwyck pretending to be a right. chef um, and homemaker, and cool. it was it wasn't Gary Cooper, was it? Who was in Christmas? Yeah. They came to Westport yeah. <laughs> from New York. Great memories, Carol. I think this <laughs> is wonderful. Uh, does anybody else have a memory before we wrap this up? Carol, maybe yes. I uh, kind of put a pin on everything. Um, the other day on a Facebook page about Bridgeport, somebody posted a ad from 1954 announcing the opening of the Beverly Theater. Oh. The ultimate in movie comfort, more yes. parking, more air conditioning, oy, bigger seats, the ultimate movie experience. They made this place out to be, you know, a, a paradise on earth. It was a yes. But Carol, what was amazing was that it was a very wordy ad, and it was amazing how much of a push they were doing to advertise this place. They they were making this place out to seem like the best thing on earth. It was a movie theater, but I guess that was the heyday, perhaps, of American it, cinema. It probably was. The uh, best thing on earth in 1954 here. Yeah. Yep. Really. And several of us, Carol, had birthday parties. Oh. I had at least one or two at uh, mm. birthday parties at the Beverly Theater. Wow. Watching, and now it's a storage place. Watching matinees, like one of them was a Jerry Lewis movie. Yeah. I, so... There's some fond memories of, of, of that. In 2024, we don't have a movie theater in Fairfield or Bridgeport. Isn't that something? Really? Wow. Yeah. So, uh, How sad is well, that? Well, I would like to say, as I wrap this up, we went much longer than I thought, and I wasn't going to stop it. That's for sure. Um, first of all, thank you all for your participation, because whenever... We can bring people in when it's timely to do. It's really great. And we certainly went around the world, which we do a lot at Rhoda Shalom. Paul and Marsha, I said it before, but I'll say it again. You are amazing. Your knowledge is just incredible. Yeah. And, and uh, the way you and Rabbi Eisenberg work together and make this happen, it's so fluid. If if we didn't know, we would think that you rehearsed for hours. We and did. I know we did not that it. We, have, we haven't even talked for a month except on the screen yeah. here. <laughs> and and so it's wonderful because it's just so perfect. So on behalf of Rhoda Shalom, I want to thank you both, the friends, our friends, and Rabbi Eisenberg for a another wonderful session 
and to tell you that next year we're going to do it again with a different theme. Uh, and the last thing I want to tell you is this Shabbat, we are going to have services in person with a special kiddish that Jill um, is sponsoring. And it should be lovely. Nima's smiling. She knows the food is going to be terrific. So between Nima and Rabbi Eisenberg, being together, our two rabbis in one room instead of on Zoom, what more could you ask for? So come along. We'll be looking to see you and looking forward to seeing you. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Stay Carol. safe. Thank you, Paul and Marsha. Thank you. Carol, Carol. Yes. Are we going to have services in the chapel or in Friend Hall? Friend Hall. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we think Friend Hall is a better option because, you know, norovirus and other things yes. going around and it's still winter. And yeah. so we won't, Friend we Hall, be, we can spread yeah. out a little more. We won't be sitting in each other's laps. Right. Does that help, <laughs> Sheila? The, thank you, Paula, Marcia. And I was just thank wondering, you. is that Trixie? Is that the new one? Is that this the number is, three? This one is Trixie. Yeah. Yoda got up for a minute. Uh, he just got down. He's the bigger one. And we well, only because of Facebook, I know your 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 family there. So <laughs> she's not here. So the other one's not here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, oh, welcome, thank Trixie. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. We like you. Thank you. Have a very nice. See you Saturday. Thank you. In yeah. one day. Paul, I mentioned Friend Hall not because you're here, but because we really are having services in Friend Hall. <laughs> Why not? I can't think of a better, better named place. There you go. 